Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. It's great to have you here. My name's Jane Baylor and today I'm with Tim Bins, the A&R director and co-owner of New State Entertainment, which is an independent record label established for over 30 years in the UK. So, Tim, it's great to have you here. Hola. Yeah, so in this interview, we're going to talk about the massive changes that have happened in the music industry as a result of the transition from vinyl to streaming and everything in between, because it's been a really, really big kind of era, I suppose, over the last um, decade, but actually over the last several decades, really. So I think just to talk about the business of music, what's actually happening now, what are the trends, what are the changes, all of those kind of things. And I think so many people are interested in music. It's really fantastic to have an opportunity just to go behind the scenes and really hear it from from a pro as it were thanks for having me also yeah it's great okay let's get into it then so before we get into talking about the music industry let's talk about you tim so tell us about your background how did you how did you start in this industry honestly i kind of started at been a fan of music like I guess anyone in the music industry really I've been a raver in the sort of mid to late 80s getting into electronic music like that and then sort of fell out of university into some jobs that I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to go with and ended up doing a a bunch of sort of loosely music related jobs for Wembley Stadium in the ticket office and our price records, selling, actually working behind the counter, selling records, CDs, tapes, that kind of thing. And then weirdly progressed from there. I answered an ad in the NME for people to review new music for a music industry publication called The Tip Sheet, which was music industry magazine, weekly magazine, run by music industry Svengali, Jonathan King. And from there, I progressed to be the dance editor and the deputy editor, and then got asked to go and work for a UK record label, Chrysalis Records, and their dance music department called Tempo, by a lovely chap called Ken Grunbaum. And uh, he kind of gave me my first job in the music industry. And I did a bit of promotions and A&R scouting and, and, you know, the the sort of lower junior level stuff. Stayed there for a little while and then turned up for work one morning and they said, sorry, Tim, you can't come to the office. You've all been made redundant, which was a bit of a shocker. It's when EMI was going through some massive changes and just downsized kind of like everything really hastily. And kind of didn't want know what to do and obviously had a bunch of mates who worked in the music industry and one of those was my business partner Tom or now business partner Tom um, and he was kind of more of a mate at the time and he did the uh, he worked for Telstar Records and uh, did the Sky Magazine um, dance chart at the time and he was starting a, a company he said oh you know what why don't you go and do that and so we did and that's where we are still yeah. with New State. that's Amazing. kind of part of history yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so a, a lot of your career has been centred around the whole dance music scene, hasn't it? Correct. With the rave yeah. scene, as it were. I so, mean, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty, pretty much solely that. There was, you know, there's been a couple of periods when we've done music that's not dance music, but it's it's mainly electronic music, yeah. Mm. So, I mean, what impact did that did that that huge kind of rave culture that came out i suppose it was really the early 90s wasn't it when it really kind of hit the mainstream what impact did that have on the music industry as a whole i think at the time no one took it very seriously because it was just like a bunch of people getting off their heads in the field yeah. and then all, all, all of a sudden like you know these records started appearing in the charts because they you know, got picked up by record labels and you know, everyone went, oh, hang on a minute, maybe there's something in this. And, you know, it's all around since. Yeah. So you've you've actually spent quite a lot of time on tour, haven't you, with some quite big names in that industry, haven't you, Tim? And you've got some stories, haven't you, as well? 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've worked with a lot of people over the years, like from Tiesto to Paul Oakenfold to Paul Van Dyke. We work with some of the biggest brands in, in dance music, especially like Ibiza Focus, like Pasha. And then on the UK side, Cream, God's Kitchen. I mean, if you're into electronic music, you'll know what those brands are and you'll, you'll remember those clubs as being seminal clubs. And, and, you know, a lot of them still are, you know, Cream's still doing Cream Fields, big, biggest UK, maybe European electronic music festival. It's been a pretty broad church, but all, all under the electronic music roof. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the business of music then. So how do people make money in the music industry these days? That's the business of music, right? With difficulty. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a lot of challenges that, that didn't used to be there. Um, okay. Mainly down to margins. You know, the margins on a, on a stream are massively significantly less than they were on a CD or a piece of vinyl. Okay. Uh, and obviously, you know, streaming has kind of democratised the music industry as well. So anyone can literally put out a record now, which, you know, has kind of eroded the quality maybe of some of the, the music out there. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's been seismic, you know. When you, you look at the, the way that we used to sell CDs and, and vinyl, you know, the margins on, on a CD, for instance, at a retail price of like 10, 13 quid. You know, the dealer price would be seven or eight pounds on that. So, you know, as a label, you're collecting that kind of money on every um, every every CD that you sell. Obviously, the pay through to the artist is going to be a percentage of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at streams now and it, it, we're talking fractions of pennies. Mm -hmm. So you know, to, to actually make the same amount of money, the volume of streams has to increase massively. Mm -hmm. um, to make up the difference and is the volume of streams increasing over say for example people purchasing cds back in the day i, I don't know i guess you know the, the subscriber base for music now may be more you know it's it's, it's apples and oranges really you know you've got a, a one-time purchase of of an item that you know once it leaves the shop you can't track where it goes you know someone will take a cd home and they might listen to it 50 times, they might listen to it 50,000 times, but you only get paid once. But with streaming, it, it's kind of, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving because in theory, you should get paid for every time someone listens to it. Mm. And uh, I think as they say in Scotland, many a mickle makes a muckle or many a muckle makes a mickle, one of them. Yeah, two. yeah, yeah. So do the musicians, where do they make their money from? Is it live performances or are there artists who are making a lot of money from streaming? I think you can still make money from streaming, but the, you know, like I said, you know, the volume has to be massive. Right. You know, we're talking hundreds of millions of streams. Yeah. But I'm going to say that any any artist who's doing that kind of level of streaming is actually making more from live music and merchandise than they are from music. Yeah. Okay. So that's really where the money is. Okay, so tell us about your business model, Tim, because you've got a very successful business in New State Entertainment. So what is it that you've done? Because you've been running that business for quite a while to create the value in that business. I mean, it's, you know, it's pretty successful as an independent label. It's all yeah. self-funded. We've never taken outside investment. So I, I guess in that respect, we're still here after 30, nearly 30 years. So, yeah, as, as a model goes, it, it's kind of, you know, be realistic and, don't overstretch yourselves and, and invest in stuff that you know about. So, yeah. you know, we managed to acquire some catalogues with the longevity and mm -hmm. um, those have some kind of residence in, in streaming, but also in kind of like physical world still where you can do like limited edition physical vinyl releases and, and the like. But, you know, it's mainly through just being careful and, and investing in stuff that we know about. Yeah. So, I mean, it's basically rights based, isn't it? It's sort of, you know, holding the rights to the catalogue, isn't it? That's where the business model lies. Am I right? Yeah, correct. It's it's rights acquisition. I mean, when you, mm -hmm. you sign a, a, a track, you acquire the rights for a certain amount of time. Yeah. Uh, or in perpetuity, depending on what sort of deal you do. But, you know, the, those kind of deals now are, are not as uh, predominant as they used to be that the whole kind of like we, we own your music forever deal was more of a child of like the 80s, 90s and noughties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, most artists these days probably do a limited term license, but we're lucky in respect that we've got some worldwide in perpetuity repertoire and rights that we own. And, and like I said, those continue to create revenue via streaming in the background. Mm. And presumably, if people want to use those tracks, for example, on an advertisement or perhaps a TV program or a movie or something like that, I'm sure that that's another way that they can monetize, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, sync licenses, which is the actual use of a, a, a track in, in like a TV ad or a movie, have always been around in the music industry and mm. yeah, there's always been an income stream. But now there's so much more content online through Netflix and Amazon Studios and, and, and Apple TV and also, you know, adverts running online rather than just on the TV. People mm. need to, to use music and, and generally if it's a big campaign, then they'll come and they'll license the tracks that they want to use and, and it's, a, it's an extra uh, revenue stream. Yeah, correct. Yeah, that's really interesting, Tim. So, I mean, how important was it to you to actually specialise in electronic dance music or w did you ever think of diversifying into different genres, for example? And, you know, uh, it's like I said before, you know, stick to what you know. And, mm. <laughs> You know, we know about electronic music, so it, it, it was the most logical place to put our to put our money, so to speak. But we have dabbled in other areas. We we did a project called Senor Coconut, which I guess it was kind of related to electronic music because it was a guy doing like Latin jazz bossa nova cover versions of electronic music, and you know, the, the first album was a whole album of Kraftwerk covers, and it was quite sort of funny and amusing but also quite hip at the moment at the time it came out and you know it worked randomly and you know it, we got lucky there and yeah so you know it's, it's you pick your projects basically yeah and you have spent some time producing as well haven't you Tim you do go into the studio a fair bit as well don't you yeah but I don't push any buttons I can't claim to, to do that at all that's not not my thing I'm kind okay. of the guy who's I'm kind of the guy who sits on the sofa at the back of the, the studio and goes, oh, yeah, I like that. Or, no, I don't <laughs> like that. I mean, well, I'm pretty clueless when it comes to, to actually, like, you know, engineering. And luckily, uh, we've got a great team of people that we work with regularly who actually know about that mm. and uh, who I trust. So, yeah, I'm just a pair of ears. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, look, somebody's got to do it, right? <laughs> Which yeah, is good. yeah, but you know, it's it's a team effort. But it's not just solely down to me. And yeah, you know, I, I, God, you know, if it was just down to me, we'd have signed some terrible records, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, and some people um, might say we have signed some terrible records, but hey, we <laughs> like them. Yeah, well, that's the main thing, isn't it? And yeah. so also, because obviously you have a and r background, for people that don't know what A&R is, how can you explain that? Going out, finding artists and signing them, liaising with them and their management to get a product out to market. Mm. Uh, but, you know, because we're a small company, I'm, I'm kind of across marketing as well. And, mm. you know, it's, it's a multitasking role, really. Yeah, it's not yeah. Big. You have to kind of have uh, have a bit of a grounding in, in pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, in terms of spotting and signing artists, do you does your business still do that, or are you just looking? Have you just been looking for established artists and established catalogs? It's a blend. You know, catalogs like like I said before are great because the, there's a, a proven track record there and. You know, you can model the way that they're going to behave over a number of years. We, we do go out and sign other tracks and, and one-off singles and try and develop them. But that's, you know, it's become increasingly harder to do that. And there's a, there's, um, there's a lot of challenges. Yeah. And why is that, Tim? Volume. Uh, it's just a volume of light stuff okay. out there. You know, Saturated. creating enough noise. Yeah, breaking through. You know, everything's so reliant and driven on, on social media to a certain extent with TikTok and Instagram and mm -hmm. that those those are big drivers for records that can actually cross over. So if you're not predominant on one of those platforms then you, you've got you're in second place already. Right. We do try we do try and sign artists who've got like a you know a social media imprint and they're active on social media. 
but you know sometimes that's not enough and you know, right. you, you, still, you still got the, the, the traditional gatekeepers as well at radio and and mm -hmm. PR press and etc and then you've got additional gatekeepers at the uh, the DSPs which are the streaming platforms like Spotify and Apple who uh, are editorial gatekeepers who, who control access to playlists on the platforms so that you know you've got a, a lot of factors to juggle when actually releasing a record these days mm, a lot more that's very over. yeah that's very interesting so it's a it's a, a blend really of all those different people and platforms that you've got to influence and of course at the end of the day the music's got to be good as well right I mean it's not just about the marketing is it People have got yeah. to pick up and pick up on and actually like the music. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And you know, you, you try and cover the bases by doing different genres. And and you know, you put out a house record, you might put out a techno record. I mean, we've we've also always signed records from the heart, and we do the records that we like. We can't afford to chase, you know, like checkbook A and R. We, we can't, you know, we're not Universal or or, or Warner's or. Sony and you know we haven't got a massive checkbook where we can run down down the road chasing the you know the the thing that's got a huge trend on TikTok and you know it requires hundreds of thousand pounds advance that's not it's not the game that we're in yeah I mean I suppose some people are in, into that game but essentially by not being or by not being in that game then you become a boutique really don't you you, like, yeah, I mean, you know, record. sadly, the the, the, ma the major labels are, are driven by market share, and mm. you know they have to they have to do that to, to keep their market share alive. Yeah, and, so that's uh, a different game, isn't it? It is. Yeah, you know, an eighty thousand pound advance on a track is a punt to them, whereas you know an eighty thousand pound advance for us that's a lot of money, mm. and uh, you know it's a big difference. Yeah, so you mentioned TikTok. So would you say that TikTok is the most influential platform at the moment for emerging artists? Yes. <laughs> wow, really? Yeah, interesting. I mean, I'm not an expert on TikTok and I don't claim to be and I never have. I've actually, you know, we've got a, a social media person who here who is more of an expert on TikTok. So I really can't kind of like comment too much on TikTok. And, but I, it is the, the, a massive driver though. Yeah, I know that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I see quite a few musicians on, on TikTok and I see people who are obviously trying to make it and they're working very, very hard at, you know, filming themselves in, you know, singing in different places. And, and I'm like, there, there's got to be a reason why they're doing that. And so now I know. <laughs> it's, just, it's just about getting enough, con as much content out there as you possibly can. And, yeah. You know, trying to get your track into the algorithm of, of you know, whatever platform you're on. So, yeah, that's kind of the basis of it. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, let's say, you know, there might be some people listening and maybe they or maybe somebody in their family, maybe their kids or something like that, you know, have aspirations to, you know, to go out there in the music industry and make a success of it as a musician. So what advice would you give them from a business perspective? Don't give up. <laughs> Don't give up. Yeah. Always a good piece of advice no, it, it can be soul destroying for new artists you know they, 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 they like busting a nut putting loads of content on on these social platforms like instagram and tiktok and you know not getting seen and it can be soul destroying and you mm -hmm. know they put a record out they finally get a deal and put a record out and you know it gets a thousand streams but you know it, it's, it's it's about persistence and you know sadly because a lot of the digital platforms and music platforms are algorithmic based it's mm. it's about you know the they reward for frequency of release so it's just about kind of keeping keeping going and keeping releasing your music if you can and like yes. i've said at the top of the conversation you know you don't you don't have to be signed to a label these days to to get your music heard you know mm. there are distribution platforms like cd baby etc where you can get music out there yourself as an artist and you know it, it has democratized the music industry and you know made it a lot easier for people just to get their music out i mean i suppose you could say in many respects it also parallels things like tv where you know once upon a time nobody could become famous unless they were on tv or 
in a movie or, you know, they had access to those big audiences that were provided by somebody else. But of course, now anybody can set themselves up on TikTok, right, or YouTube or any of the social media platforms and actually get an audience there. So it's really, it's really changed, hasn't it? Hugely. Yeah, that's, that's, you know, that's an exact parallel. And, you know, it's... The accessibility levels have, have definitely increased. You know, it was previously pretty difficult to get a record deal in, like, in the 80s and 90s. There were a lot of people out there who wanted to release their music but just couldn't get a record deal. And, mm. you know, to go and press your own record and sell it into like HMV and, and, and Woolworths at the time and, you know, get it into the supermarkets was nigh impossible because no one would take it seriously. Mm. Uh, but, you know, the... The landscape has changed totally. Yeah, which really, you know, makes me kind of appreciate it. I I, I think I was talking fairly recently about, you know, a friend friend of my daughter's. So, you know, well, I went to see her the other night when she was playing at the O2, supporting the 1975. So her band's called Japanese House. Yeah. So, I mean, really, you know, she's done so well, hasn't she? Anybody that gets to that level to play in front of that big audience and really kind of build a very, very loyal following, which she has done. She, you know, it must have taken a lot to get there. I mean, I I don't know about her specific journey, but I'm guessing, Mm. did it, did it start with her promoting her own music on social platforms and YouTube or how did it start? What was the story? Well, I do know that, yeah, she started very early. So she started when she was, she was writing her own songs when she was about eight years old. So I know that much. And so she's been at it for a very, very long time. And I think that, I think she was very prolific. You know, you mentioned frequency. I think she writes a lot and she puts a lot out. And I think she just kept on doing it because she'd do it. I think whether anybody paid her or not, when you think about it, she was doing it as a kid. It's absolute passion. And I think a lot of, a lot of people, they have music as a passion. I mean, I'm passionate about music. I really love it. I just don't know how to how to play it <laughs> really but uh, yeah just just one of those things really I think if you've got the passion for anything then I think if you are that passionate then you will do it whether there's money in your bank account or not you will find a way won't you and I think that's what carries people through really isn't it I think you know with, with music it's a passion and you you have to have that and it's you know similarly when, when you're running a label uh, you know it's a passion project yeah, um, and we do it because we love it, and you know we love the music, and there's a certain element of the lifestyle as well. We love the lifestyle, so you know it's yeah. There's there's a lot of different passion elements. Yeah, and you've you've travelled all over the world, haven't you, with a lot of a lot of artists, and you've been to some amazing places. You've met some amazing people. You you've had a pretty good life, really, haven't you, Tim? The in, the music industry has has done you quite well, hasn't it? Despite yeah. the challenges. It's comfortable, yeah. I mean, you know, and I've been lucky enough to to do a bit of travelling off the back of it, yeah, for sure, and seen some things. So, yeah, I I can't complain, really. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Tim. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you join us. So if anybody wants to get in touch with you, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, Just drop me an email, tim at newstate.com. Okay, well, that's easy to remember, isn't it? So that's tim at newstake.com. And if yeah, anybody well, wants to... It's pretty, yeah. open, it's pretty open book, so, you know, just reach out. I'm happy yeah. to chat with anyone. That's amazing. And, I, you know, I can definitely say that Tim is an extremely helpful guy, you know, who is very, very nice guy. So if you have any questions about the music industry, about getting started in the music industry, nice. about, you know, getting your music more successful, then, you know, Tim, Tim is the guy to ask. And so, yeah, I mean, look, it's been, a, as I said, it's been a pleasure. So what's on the cards for you for the rest of the year, Tim, before we, we go? More of the same. We've yeah. got a couple of reissues coming up. It's a, an anniversary for one of Zero Seven's album. It's Zero Seven or a band that we have as part of the catalogue. Yeah. Um, we're, we're working on some remixes for uh, Paul Oakenfold as well. There's a couple of new artists that we're kind of trying to develop as well. And, yeah, so, you know, the, the wheels keep turning. Lots happening. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tim. It's been great. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks for joining us. Cheers, Jane. Thanks a lot.